morning. I just got back from Santa Cruz. I got to take some time off to go to uh, Mission Springs. If you don't know where that is, that is a covenant um, retreat to have part of the nomination. I was able to go there and spend time with my wife's family and go to a conference in which it's called camp and we go and we listen to seminars and talks and just hang out. The kids are running around crazy. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, speaking of kids, there was 11 kids and I do believe nine of them were under the age of 10. Lots of noise. But it was good. It was enjoyable. I really appreciate being able to go back and enjoying that conference. It was the first time I was able to go to the conference and not have to work it. Every other year, I've been working with the kids or making sure that snack was out or making sure that people were where they're supposed to be. It was just nice to go and to relax. And I thank you for allowing me to do that. Mission Springs is a place that has been a big part of my life that I've really enjoyed. Um, when I was in high school, I went to this camp called Wild Oak, and it was a high adventure camp. We go do things like surfing, and we go hiking and well, kind of like sort of extreme stuff for a suburban kid like me. And we did mountain biking. And I grew up using my bike a lot. It was my main mode of transportation and entertainment as a kid. We'd ride around the cul-de-sac that I grew up in, and we'd go to the store, we'd take our bikes. I had a mountain bike, had shocks in the front. It was really cool. It was a mongoose. But we did some actual mountain biking. We actually did single track. And there's like, okay, you guys have ridden a bike before, but this is a tad bit different. You're going to be in this little narrow thing, but you can't pass each other. It's a single track, so you literally have space for one tire. And there's a couple of things you should know. First off, um, it's going to be difficult. Second off, um, there's going to be roots and other obstacles, and there might be cliffs. But if you remember this one thing, everything will be okay. Keep your eye where you want to go. So you just look at where you want to go, and you'll go there. Pretty straightforward, right? So you go from these big wide roads into these single tracks, and there's berry bushes and poison oak to start with, and then all of a sudden there's these cliffs that drop into the San Lorenzo River. And you're like, okay, it's all right. And you're just watching, and you slowly learn that, hey, if I just focus where I want to go, I'll go. And you sort of intuitively steer there. The title of our sermon today is What Are You Seeking? What are we seeking? Our eyes ought to be on Christ, on God. But when we start looking to the left and to the right, we start getting distracted and we get um, a little bit off balance. And it's very easy to steer towards the things we're looking for. We're going to un back, or unpack this as we look into this new series called The Good and Beautiful God. If you haven't figured it out, based on what we sung this morning, what Pastor Lee was explaining earlier, we're going to talk about how God is good for the next few weeks. So before we dive in, go ahead, bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, as I've been preparing for this, this, this series, Lord, I've been repeating this over and over, God, that you are good and that you are beautiful. As we com continue to repeat that, Lord, as we start saying that to ourselves, that we take it from our head and putting it to our heart, that it flows through everything that we do. That we come to know and understand, not that you are good, but how you are good and how that plays out in our life. That nothing compares to that, Lord. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So like I said, the name of this, this sermon, this talk, is What Are You Seeking?, so easy to go and get distracted by the things around us, but we are reminded by Scripture to keep our eyes on Christ. The book we're going to be diving into, you can get it on Amazon. It is called The Good and Beautiful God, and it has a picture of a couple of peaches on the front, and yeah, you can get it on Amazon. It's like new for 14 bucks. You can get it used for like five or on the Kindle for 12. You don't need the book. But it goes into play, like, I can't, we can't cover everything that's in a chapter in 30 to 40 minutes. So if you go and get it, you can read along and follow along. But it's a great resource. So it's called The Good and Beautiful God. And, yep, falling in love with a God Jesus knows. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be walking through this book. How do we know 
and better understand and internalize the knowledge that God is good and that he is beautiful. You see, we need to be constantly reminded that God is good and he is beautiful. We can forget that when we look at other places and we forget what Jesus says. Is there an echo right here? Is it just me? Just my head. Okay, good. Just making sure I'm like... So we're going to be looking at what Jesus has to say about the God that we know. We're going to be looking at Scripture to say, hey, what does God or, or Jesus remind us about God? And throughout the Gospels, Jesus talks in parables. He tells parables to his disciples. He tells them to the Pharisees and the people around him. And he does this in order to make them think. And it's like, hey, this is what you know, what you've been told about God. But look at what Scripture says. It redirects them to look back at Scripture and it's like, hey, this is what the teaching has been by religious leaders. But what does Scripture say? What do we know about God? And what do we know about God in light of the fact that Jesus Christ has come, the Messiah is coming? We need to look at Scripture to see God's attributes, who he really is. So for this series, we're walking through the truth that God is good and that he is beautiful. We'll be breaking down some of his attributes. If you wanted some other reading, Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer is a great place to start. It goes through and talks about who God is in deep detail, and it's beautifully written. But each week, as we walk through this book, The Good and Beautiful God, we'll have three major components. First, we'll be looking at the false narrative. What does the world say about God in relation to that topic? What does the world have to say about God in relation to that topic? Maybe it's a misunderstanding of who God is. Maybe it's stripping away some myths that we've created about who God is based on our own experiences. The second is the Jesus narrative. What does Jesus show us about God? We look at Scripture. We look at the Old and New Testament to know about the nature of God and how that applies to us. Then lastly, there is soul training. You guys heard of Soul Cycle before? It's like a bicycle place. You go and you sit on stationary bikes and you sweat a lot. And then, yeah, similar, but this is soul training. We're training our souls. And this is what we'll talk about spiritual disciplines in a little bit. But it's a practice of spiritual disciplines that allow us to be more in tune with what the Holy Spirit has to say to better internalize what Scripture says so we can move from knowing, thinking, to believing what God is or who God is. So what is the narrative? Does anybody want to venture a guess? I don't have my candy with me, sorry. <laughs> it works really well with junior high and high schoolers. Like, you got an answer? Yeah, good, that's good. No, sorry, I don't have that. All right, it's some upstairs. Um, just kidding, we're not gonna do that. But stories or s narratives are stories that we hold on to. We use to understand and navigate the world to make judgments. These are narratives. These are things that we tell ourselves, maybe influenced by our experiences, that allow us to navigate this world, to make judgments quickly. Perhaps the first time you had green ice cream, someone's like, hey, here's some green ice cream. And they didn't tell you what flavor it was. And you take a big bite, and you're like, oh, this is going to be so good. It's ice cream, of course, yeah? It's going to be good. It's going to be refreshing. You take a bite, and it's kind of bitter and sour. And you're like, what the heck is this? And they're sort of like chuckling to themselves. <laughs> it's spinach. So they pureed spinach and throw it in a blender and mix it with all these other good things like sugar and the cream. And they threw it in the freezer and it's like, hey, we're going to trick Zach. This didn't actually happen. But we're going to make him think that he's going to eat some really green ice cream. It's going to be delicious. And afterwards, you're gun shy. You think every green ice cream is going to be nasty. You're like, oh, here's some green ice cream. Zach's like, nope, not going to touch that. It's not going to be good. You're missing out on like pistachio, um, what are the, there's green team lime sorbet, mint chocolate chip. Imagine what spinach ice cream, what would you put in like little chocolate chips and mint or in a spinach ice cream? That'd be nasty. But you're gun shy now because now you have this judgment, you have this part of your narrative that green ice cream is bad. And these narratives, these stories we're tell, we tell ourselves influenced by a couple different things. There's three major things that influence this. First off is family. 
our stories that we get from our families, maybe from our experiences with our families. The first time I was away from home for Thanksgiving, I was, I was just turned 21. I had taken a job in another town, and it was, I had to work the day after and the day before, and I couldn't get home to, for Thanksgiving. So a, a coworker invited me over. And for me as a kid, we always did buffet style. So all the food is laid out on this huge table, and everybody has their, like, their specialties, and there's two different people, types of turkey because someone smoked it and someone baked it in the oven. And it's ridiculous. There's lots of food. And the, the adults would go through first. They would eat first, and then the children would go eat. And then the children would eat again because they were still hungry. So I show up at this house, and they had this one long table, beautifully set with china and fine silverware. There was candles, and all the food was spread out nicely and neatly, like you would see on like a TV show. And everybody would sit there, and they'd take turns talking. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, this is so different. I'm just eating the turkey. It's like, this is really good, but it's so different. Because a family is just a, a mass of noise. There's adult tables and children's table and the in-between tables and just people are talking over themselves and there's food everywhere and it's just total chaos. But here was this, oh, hi, John. What was your day like? And he would talk and then pass it on to someone else. And that's how we grew up as family. Our family influences how we do things. There's other examples I'm sure that come to mind. Like, hey, how does this work? How, why do I do what I do? Our narrative is informed by that. Culture is the second one. Our culture influences what we believe. Culture, believe it or not, is all around us. It's the way we talk, the way we dress, the things that we eat, the media that we esteem, Maybe it's a t television show that is really popular now, or maybe it's what's being flung around on social media. That is all part of a culture. Culture is the culmination of society, of the norms. And those things influence us, either if we know it or not. They're constantly bombarding us. We constantly see that. If we take time and look at it, we might see it. And lastly, we have religion. What are your experiences with the church? If you look around the people in this room, if you look at anybody here, they probably have a different experience with church than you. I grew up in church. My parents pretty much took me to church whenever the church stores were open. I grew up working at, or watching my parents work junior hires, going to Sunday morning services, midweek Bible studies. I remember being there almost all the time. It seemed like I was there forever. Some of y'all had really bad experiences with the church and you're like, nope, I'm gonna leave. And then God called you back. And others of you, is like, I didn't know what church was when I was a kid. But our experiences with our religion, our church, our religion in general, forms our narratives. And our narratives become our truth. And if our stories are formed by our family, our culture, on our religion, they may not be completely in line with what Scripture has to say. So when, how do we change that? We dive into Scripture. Scripture tells us who God is, and it affirms it as well. So this is the second part. Sorry, this will be the first part. Remember, there's three major parts of, a, of this book. There's the false narrative, the Jesus narrative, and then soul training. So our false narrative that we're going to look at today, we have to talk about narratives so we're on the same page. But our false narrative is that we change our own willpower. We change by our own willpower. There you go. Think of it this way. Um, we all have experiences where we ask God to be like him, and we do nothing to facilitate that change. Hey, God, let me be more like you. Let me be more holy. And you go about the same thing. A few years ago, I decided I want to be a bodybuilder. And I did that for about three months, and I realized I don't like eating that way, so I decided to become a power lifter. If you don't know what a power lifter is, a person who trains to be really strong in three different lifts. They literally pick up weight and put it back down in the same place over and over again. And they do a squat, which is a bar on their back. They squat down and squat back up. That's all they do. And they do a bench press, which they lay on their back, and they push a bar up or down, then up. And then they do a deadlift, which they literally pick something up and put something down. 
And if I had said, like, I'm going to be a power lifter, and I didn't change anything I was doing, I didn't go to the gym, I didn't change my nutrition, what do you think would happen? Nothing. I can't will myself into doing something if there's no action there. There's no change in the way I think about life and do life. The same thing is we're told, like, hey, if we just think hard enough, it will happen. We can will ourselves to change. That's not true. Our will is influenced by three things. There's a lot of threes in this sermon, I realized. Don't forget them. There's like nine of them. No. So there's three primary influences on our will. First off is the mind. How do we think about things? The way we think about things in our mind will create emotions. And out of emotions, that will lead to decisions or action. I just got a new phone because my old one wasn't charging anymore, and it's sort of important to have a phone that works these days. And I spent weeks upon weeks trying to figure out the phone that I was going to get. And if you talk to anybody in this room, they'll probably tell you, buy an Apple phone. And I'm like, heck no, I'm not going to do that. And I was looking through all these different kinds of other phones, trying to figure out what I wanted. And then suddenly I got fixated on one, and it just happened. I'm like, I want to get this one, but no, this one. My mind started creating emotions like, I need this phone. I need this thing. And I went and got it. It led me to a decision. I don't regret it yet. But, but those things are will, if it's strong enough, those outside influences, what we think in our heads, will move us to action. The second, our bodies will follow. Our souls and our minds are all interconnected. And our bodies are pretty cool things, actually. It's a cool function. It breathes by itself usually. Heart beats. The kidneys and the, the liver work without us telling us. We don't have to like, liver, clean my blood. We don't usually tell that. Or it's our kidneys that clean our blood. Our kidneys. We don't tell our kidneys, clean my blood so it works. No. It just automatically does that. But there's some things that our body tells us that we need and we have to go act on it, such as water or food. And our body screams at us, hey, feed me or get water for me. So we have our mind that tells us, like, hey, this is what I want. This is what I should get. Then our bodies tell us to keep, save ourselves. And third, we have social contexts. We're highly influenced by those around us. Um, we might know this better as peer pressure. We look around the people and like, I want to look like them so I don't stick out. And we force ourselves to be like them. In college, I was doing research on what is the biggest influence on male body dissatisfaction, like how men see themselves. And it wasn't media. I thought at first it was going to be media. Media is going to tell men how to look at their bodies and how they should be. But it was actually family and parents. The family, if they were, how they talked to their kids about their body and everything like that, would highly influence how they saw themselves. How were they being esteemed by their parents? It wasn't the media, even though it had a strong part. But those around us, our social context, family and friends and the people we hang out with, influences how we see ourselves. So we can't will ourselves to change or by our own willpower, but what we do around us, what we surround ourselves by, changes us. So what we learn from Jesus about God is that we change by indirection. Can everybody say that? We change by indirection. Let's try that one more time. We change by indirection. This side of the room is really good with that. <laughs> this one's like... Yeah. You said it with me? Oh, man. I can't hear myself. I hear you all. So we change by indirection. Um, we, we adopt the Jesus narrative. When we start adopting the stories that God or Jesus told about God, we start moving in that direction. But we didn't do that on purpose. We start filling ourselves with Scripture. We start filling ourselves with knowledge of who God is through Scripture. We start moving towards that. We're not willing ourselves, I want to be more like God. But we're taking actions to fill ourselves with that. If, you're, if you have the book with you already, if you bought it on Kindle, it's on your phone already. This is on page 22. When we adopt Jesus' narratives about God, we will know God properly and the right actions will follow. We change not by mustering up willpower, but by changing the way we think, which will also involve changing our actions and our social environment. 
We change indirectly. Going back to what I was talking about becoming powerlifter, I was actually in school at the time. I was down at Biola, and I pretty much just studied and went to the gym. That's all I did for the time I was there. And during that time, I changed the way I was eating. I, I blocked out time in my schedule to go to the gym. I studied, not just my schoolwork, but I learned about, hey, how do you make a program to get stronger? What should I eat or what shouldn't I eat? How should I spend my time if I want to become a stronger person? And I started pouring all this information into my mind, and I started changing the way I acted. And guess what? I got stronger. It worked. The thing is, like, I couldn't just will myself to sit there like, hey, I want to get stronger. But I changed things, the inputs in my mind and everything like that to get stronger. What we think and what we do is important. We read from Corinthians 3, 2. It says, set your mind on things above and not the things on this earth. If we're focused on the things on this earth, maybe getting a new car or getting some more money so we can go on a vacation, we start losing sight of who God is. We start losing the sight that God is good, that he is good, and he provides, that he is beautiful. And we start thinking that we have to do it by ourselves, that we have to build ourselves up. But we're called to do something far greater than that, set our minds on things above. We change not by mustering up willpower, but by changing the way we think, which also involves changing our actions and our social environment. We also see this in Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. I'm going to read it once again. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you will discern what the will of God, or what is the will of God, and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Paul, in reminding us to set our eyes on Christ, that we come to know him more. And the more our eyes are set on Christ, that we are reading scripture, that we are moving towards, that we are meditating on that scripture, the more in love, the more we come to know, understand the nature of God and becomes a feedback loop. The more we see God's love, the more we want to love him. The more we see that he is good, we want to love him. And it goes and it snowballs. It gets bigger and bigger. And it transcends our current situation. We dive into scripture and we saturate our mind with the truth that is God. What is our mantra this year? Do you guys remember it? Deeper in Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. We're gonna try this. We're gonna say it all together. Deeper in Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. Perfect. So as we're diving into scripture, we are letting the Holy Spirit guide us into those truths about who God is. We come more and more in love with the good and beautiful God. So how does this all work? If you look at the screen, you'll see a triangle with a square in the middle. The triangle of transformation, it's called. And as you look on there, there's, okay, you can see it better up here, good. There's the uh, adopting the narrative of Jesus, uh, engaging in soul training exp uh, I need new glasses. No, exercises and participating in commu uh, community. Um, this is adopted from a guy named Dallas Willard. He was a uh, professor down at USC. Brilliant, brilliant man who loved God. But the first step is changing our narratives. We change the stories that are in our mind. Remember, our narratives are created by our experiences in our life. And we let Jesus Christ build those narratives and redeem those stories we have in our life. Because sometimes the narratives that define our lives, we are looking at them wrong. Our story that we're telling ourselves is maybe not the right angle. Senior year of high school, I tore my ACL. And I was like, I can't play football anymore. I've lost my identity. But because of that, I did, couldn't play football. I was able to be discipled by someone. I set aside that time that would be for sports. Someone poured into my life. And I'm still really good friends with them today. That would not have happened if I had not torn my ACL. It's a bummer. But God had redeemed that. It was used to make me grow in my knowledge of God. So we change our narrative. We change the stories in our minds about who we are and who God, are, God is. Step two, we practice soul training ex exercises. And these may be new practices for you. 
They're called spiritual disciplines. And these spiritual disciplines are things that we do, or we don't do, in order to prepare ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And each week, we're going to dive into another one, another practice that you can get engaged in in order to prepare your heart and your mind to eternal and internalize that God is good, that he is beautiful. Just like physical training for the body, we have to train our souls. Just want to let you know that if you do these spiritual formations, it's not like you're gaining a level. Like they don't only make you better, but they facilitate you getting to know God better. I had a video game analogy, but that might fall flat. Who knows? Do you guys play video games? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> and other people are like, what? It's all good. So, and then step three is participating in community. And this participation in community is reflection. So we go and do our spiritual disciplines, and then we go talk about it. And it's not like bragging, like, hey, I did the spiritual discipline perfectly this week. No, it's talking about how did it change you? What was revealed to you about the nature of God? I don't want to call it accountability per se, but it's checking in with each other. It's like, hey, how are you doing? I care about you. Therefore, I want you to succeed. We're coming alongside each other in order to know who God is better together. We're guided by the Holy Spirit in this process of asking each other, how are you doing with your walk with God? It's reflection and dialogue because we're all on the same path together. And then step four, which is the box in the middle of the triangle, is the work of the Holy Spirit. All these things, these first three steps, are all powered and guided by the Holy Spirit. Because us was saying, hey, I'm going to do this well by myself, doesn't work. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to push us to go deeper in Christ. So we're at the point where, this is the fun part, the application. So we talked about what a narrative is. We talked about how do we change that narrative. We change it by what we, what we put into our minds, how we think. We change it by our rhythms in our life. So our first soul training this, this, this year is sleep. That's right, sleep. And I must confess to you that two weeks ago, I did really good. I did the sleep thing that we're going to talk about, and it was great. And then last week was pretty good. And last night, I, got, I just got back from where it's like 60 degrees at night to 70 degrees. I didn't sleep at all last night. <laughs> but it's a process. You learn how to do this. You get better at it. But we need sleep. Sleep is utmost importance for us as we dive into this. Because we have diminished sleep. We have diminished energy to seek God. We let busyness in our life, all the tasks we feel like we need to get done in a day, push back our sleep, and it becomes something on the back burner. About 150 years ago, the average person got over nine hours of sleep a night. 40 years ago, it was eight and a half. Today, it's less than seven. A human being, if they're left to sleep without any kind of outside influence, would love to sleep about eight and a half hours. Eight and a half hours. Just think to yourself, when was the last time you slept eight, slept eight and a half hours or didn't set an alarm in the morning or went to bed before midnight? For some of us, it's a long time and it catches up with you. You can't gain back sleep easily. But sleep, or the therefore lack of sleep, is another number one enemy of Christian spiritual formation because it just creates exhaustion. Even Jesus slept. He taught that to us. The first thing when I came to this, I thought like, hey, Jesus in the boat in the middle of Galilee, and he's conked out during the middle of this storm, and the disciples are freaking out because in the middle of the sea, and it's just raging on and on and on, and Jesus is sleeping. I'm like, we should wake him up. He's sleeping through this. He's crazy. No. But we need sleep. Jesus, when he was fully God and fully human, his body needs sleep. He would remove himself from the crowds of people. There was always work to be done with those crowds, but he would remove himself from those crowds to pray and to sleep, to rest. How much more do we need if we're not fully God and fully human? We need the sleep. Our body and our souls are intertwined, so if one fails, so does the other. Sleep helps nourish the body so that our souls can thrive. And those things, there's things in our life that can make sleep hard. 
Maybe there's something like a situation at work that's get, got you up at night. You lose sleep because your soul's in turmoil. And then your soul's in turmoil, your body is tired. It feeds back. The body and soul is intertwined. James Bryan Smith, the author of the book we're working through, says this, sleep is an act of surrender. It is de- a declaration of trust. It is admitting that we are not God, who never sleeps, and that is good news. If you go to the Old Testament and you look at 1 Kings 18, you see this time where there's a king of Ahab, and it's during a bad time. Um, Israel is going through a drought because they are, were following idolatry. And Obadiah, I think is his name, it was a very good, uh, it was as close to the king. He was one of the like, right-hand man, right man, and he was a man of God. And I was, shouldn't be doing this. I should always look at my notes. <laughs> Isaiah, there we go. <laughs> Isaiah came to Obadiah. was like, hey, um, we're going to challenge Baal. And there's this challenge. And the challenge was that, hey, whoever's God brings rain is the true God. And all these prophets of Baal come out and they put up these sacrifices and they go around dancing and yelling out to God or to Baal, saying, bring rain, bring rain. And they're cutting themselves and they're, they are pouring out their lives before this God they believe in. And Elijah does this. He begins to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's asleep and must be awoken. So they shout louder and slash themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued in their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. The story goes on. Um, They stop, and... Elijah goes, and it's his turn. He builds an altar, and he puts the sacrifice on top, and he calls for a ditch to be dug around the sacrifice. And they take these huge pots of water, and they douse the altar with water. I don't know about you, but trying to build a fire when it's wet outside is hard. It is difficult. And Isaiah goes, after this has been done, it's been doused the trench all around. It's been filled with water. He goes, and he prays to God, and God answers. He wasn't sleeping. He wasn't traveling. He was always there. We need sleep. God doesn't. That is a blessing. This week, your, dis- your discipline for this week, your first spiritual discipline that you're going to try this week is sleeping. So here's the, here's the challenge. One day this week, sleep as long as it takes to feel completely rested and not a minute more or a minute less. That mean, might mean clearing your schedule a little bit, saying, hey, that early morning coffee date that I had planned to do, we need to put that off. Maybe that means going to bed a little bit earlier the night before. But sleep until you no longer feel rested. It's been a while, two weeks ago, since I've slept in a point, to a place that I felt rested. And the, 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 the thing is, if, if you feel rested, you're like, I'm gonna stay a little bit longer, maybe I'll get more rested. It's a bell curve. You get rested, and then two minutes later, it goes down, and you don't feel rested. So do this. You guys should write this on your piece of paper. Sleep until feel rest, feeling rested. You guys got that? Sleep as long as it takes to feel completely rested. Have you ever had homework that involves sleeping? I haven't. But try this. And if you're like, hey, Zach, my schedule is completely busy and I have no time to clear like 12 hours to go sleep properly, do this. Aim for three days this week, sleep more than seven hours. Because remember what we talked about, our average for at least America is seven hours or less of sleep. Our bodies probably need a little bit more than that to function properly. But three nights this week, angle for seven or more hours of sleep. You guys got that? All right. Ah, I see the paper. That's good. When I was working with like fifth and sixth graders, I was like, put your books on your head when you're done. And it's just funny. You see a whole bunch of books on their head. I won't do that to y'all. But 
Zach, you're probably maybe saying, Zach, like, it's hard to sleep. Sleep doesn't come naturally. It's something that has to be learned. It's not just something like we do well. We've forgotten how to sleep more or less. So I have some tips for how we can sleep better. So first off, we set a consistent bedtime. We say, hey, maybe, this is for me, 10 o'clock, I need to start winding down. That means I should put away my computer, turn off the TV, start brushing my teeth, read a book, do something that makes me calm down, to wind down. For me, that's sometimes making lists of all the things I have to do the next day, because if I don't, it just sits in my mind and it festers or stews. Two, don't engage in stress-inducing activities before bed. And what he means, James Bryan Smith, he usually means like screens, our social media on our phones or YouTube or the, Sunday, or the evening news causes stress and keeps us awake. Number three, avoid stimulants in the evening. So sugar, caffeine, sugar. For me, I can't really, I shouldn't drink coffee after like 12 noon because I'll be up all night long. These are things I've discovered about myself. Three, uh, four, don't force yourself to sleep. Don't just lay in bed like, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Get up and do something that will calm you. Read a book, um, maybe sort some papers. I always try to do work at night and I just <clears throat> fall asleep anyways. So find something that is calming or boring to put yourself to sleep. And lastly, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're in bed, don't reach or grab your phone. Just lay there and stay in bed. Just go back to sleep. If you wake up, just stay in bed. It's all right. So you guys got those tips? Good, good. All right. So at the end of all this, you've done your sleep for the whole week or that one day of perfect sleep sleeping as long as you need to feel rest or your seven plus hours of sleep for three nights a week. You need to brief yourself. Because if we do this and we don't talk about it, um, it's sort of all for naught. We need to be able to pull something out of this. We need to acknowledge who God is. So you can ask yourself, were you able to practice this discipline of sleep? It's not easy. I've tried. I failed last night. And if you do do it, how do you feel after it? And how does it reveal God to you? What did you learn about God or yourself, if anything, through this exercise? So the two questions you can ask yourself is, were you able to practice this discipline of sleep? How did you do it? And how did you feel? And second, what did you learn about God, if anything, through this exercise? And remember, we're doing this in community. So talk to each other. Ask each other, hey, how did you sleep last week? It's a weird question, but it's good. Ask each other and actually listen. Can you put that last slide up again? Yes. Just a reminder, if you didn't write it down the first or second time, your challenge this week is to sleep until you feel rested. Not a minute more, not a minute less. Or three nights a week this week, sleep more than seven hours. Remember, sleep is surrender. It's acknowledging that God is God that he is good and he is beautiful, that he is beyond anything that we could ever understand about ourselves, that we, are no, we, that we are not God, that we need to sleep, that we need to rest. And that when we rest, that we are able to more fully devote ourselves to knowing more about God and falling in love with him. And through it all, it is done with the Holy Spirit by our sides. If you would, go ahead, bow your heads and close your eyes. Don't go to sleep yet. You have an afternoon to nap. But Father, we come before you as we uh, stay awake with our eyes closed, Lord. And we say, thank you, God. Thank you for being a God that never sleeps, that does not need rest. But you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to model that when he was here on earth. I pray that we as a body of Christ learn how to sleep well. That we become rested, Lord that we fight the business of this world that says you have to keep on moving, you have to keep on doing this, but we find sleep so we don't get exhausted, so we can fully and more deeply understand who you are, that you are good and that you are beautiful, that you love us and that you have saved us. Lord, may our lives be that of surrender to you. We love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
Yeah, I think. Why don't you guys stand? We're going to do another song um, before we move into our time of communion.